truly is uh, it truly is this case of something very simple to explain turns out to be really complicated in the real world. And um, you guys have been the guinea pigs. This is my first opportunity to do this. I will do it a little bit differently next time. So um, for those of you who take the class again, uh, you'll get to see the, uh, the fruits of your pain. I'm, I'm assuming that I'm not going to see any of you next time. So I don't know. They haven't, uh, they haven't even opened up the position at this point. And I have to decide. And they have to decide. Although, in all fairness, I, I did talk to Ivan about this, and he doesn't really want to take it back over. Kind of enjoying teaching something different. And I know they had a hard time finding qualified people for this. And look, they, they scraped the bottom of the barrel and they put me into it. So So we'll do the usual logistics. Let's see. Uh, project four is now in the, you, if you still want to do it, the due date is April 13th. Apt it 75% credit, blah, blah, blah. There's no extensions for project five. Project five is a total bear. And what's really cool about it is that it, it, it's really, really hard. It's harder than project four. And despite the fact that it makes a whole bunch of very big simplifying assumptions, not the least of which is you're not changing the number of shards. I hadn't actually realized that. I was like, wow, because that's the logical thing to do as you start increasing your capacity. You want to change the number of shards because you want to spread things out. So in Project 5, it, see, in the ideal world, what we want to do is we want to be able to move individual keys around. But that makes our configuration space really too large because we could literally have millions of keys. You can't send somebody a table of, of where to send each key. That's not practical. So we bunch them up into some sort of a grouping, and that's what shards are. So there's the balance usually where you have more shards when you get more keys so you can do more balancing because otherwise what will happen is you end up with a non-uniform distribution. Yes, I know, it's supposed to be uniform, but in the real world, that's not the way that it actually works. So if I have six shards, there's going to be one of them that has more stuff than the others. But shards are what I use for balancing across the nodes. One of the motivations for going through the discussion of cord was, and it's a distributed hash table. A distributed hash table is a key value store, right? It's just a different name for exactly the same thing. One of the motivations for teaching that lecture is this is really how you actually build a balancing key value store where you can move individual shards around. So what you do is you put the routing table in the nodes. And so you get the configuration. Here's all of the, the, the shards. But then you go to the shard and you say, okay, I'm looking for where this key is. And you get the finger table back and it actually has the stuff that says, well, these keys are over here. So you can actually break it down that way. This kind of divide and conquer strategy is very common. If you remember how page tables worked from 3.13, it's kind of the same thing except infinitely more flexible. So Project 5 is a very interesting beast, and I don't want you to stress out too much about it. It is clear that, um, I, I was looking at the data, I think I mentioned this, I was looking at the data from the Georgia Tech use of, of Project 5, and last term the median was 38. The max was 100. And the min was like zero. But it was 38. It was like, wow. Um, so there's going to have to be some sort of scaling here because you can't take 38 and use that as 20% of the grade. I don't want people to stress too much. It's hard. You're going to get the first part pretty easily. It's not that hard. It gets harder as you go into that project. And you now have, what, two weeks and two days 
to finish it. <laughs> I just, and then suddenly, <gasps> uh, final exam is April 20th. I don't know if you've noticed, but in fact, there is a, uh, a Piazza thread and a Canvas assignment where you can reduce your stress now by spiking the punch and putting questions in that you know the answers to. And I, one of them was very clever. It was just, I read this and I said, wow, this is better than anything I could have ever written. That's awesome. I don't know if you saw that one, but that was the one where ChatGPT takes over the world. Um, and I, I did like question two, which was, you know, which the password was the t-shirt that I wore twice. And I realized I could actually play a really dirty trick here, and that is never wear a t-shirt twice. In which case, then the password would just be carriage return. Hmm. I don't like this. Um, so take advantage of that. Part of this is to make you think back. What did I learn that I thought was important or interesting in this class? So I'm, I'm using this also as a feedback cycle to understand what people thought was significant, what people didn't think was significant. Good questions are like that one where they, 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 they plant a scenario and then they ask you a series of questions off of that. That's great. That is like exactly what I'd look, like to see. Um, some of the questions are a little more vague. And that's harder, harder for me to action, right? I mean, ideally, I want you to do all the work here. No. Here's the question and here's, here's, uh, here's the four answers that I would suggest using, one of which is correct and three of which are wrong. Or you could be really tricky and say they're all right. Da, 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 da. Uh, closes April. Um, I probably should have put the rest of the date there. It closes on Sunday, I think, or mon Monday. Next Monday, right? Because I always use Mondays. Uh, nothing's changed here. I haven't heard from any of the alternate path people on doing a presentation, so... Um, it may just be me talking on Thursday, April 13th, which will be really boring. But we'll talk about the, the final, which will be what people are stressing about at that point. Well, no, it'll be April 13th, and the Project 5 will still be due, so people will be stressing about that as well. Uh, so countdown, this is the last three weeks of the term. Today's lecture is today's lecture. There won't be a lecture on Thursday. I, I just put that up on website. Um, I'm going to be working on a paper that's due on Thursday. Uh, we'll have the Byzantine Fault Tolerant lecture on the 4th, and then on the 6th we'll have a guest lecture. On the 11th we'll have a guest lecture. The guest lecture on the 6th is actually being presented this week downtown uh, at uh, the Sheraton Wall Center for the um, ASPLOS conference. Architectural support, support for Programming Languages and Operating Systems, ASPLOS. So it's actually a systems conference, and it includes some of the things that we've talked about before. So you can see kind of a real-world use for some of, the, some of what we talked about. It's actually about um, formal verification and automated code generation. And if I get anybody who wants to do a presentation, we'll do those on the 13th. Otherwise, it's just going to be a review session. So people will probably just sleep in or continue working on Project 5. Any questions? So I did actually get, I, I started mentioning that before I started. I, I received an email last night from somebody who's had a very difficult term. There's been several people who have had some challenges this term. I, everybody has some level of challenges. Um, and they had decided uh, to withdraw from the course using late withdrawal. Like lots of people don't know, you can actually withdraw from a class pretty much any time. Um, you just have to justify it to somebody. There's a date where you don't have to do any justification, and after that, you have to file paperwork, which itself can be its own huge mountain to climb. Um, and they, they said that they really enjoyed the class, but then unfortunately, because of the other circumstances, they had shorted, they had to triage. And this was the class they triaged, and then they said, thank you very much. And you know, that there was a lot of passion for the class, 
Um, and you know, that, that they appreciated that. They really liked the material. They hoped to study it in the future. Um, and I mean, when, the, when their situation first came up, I said, you need to take care of yourself. Apparently that, that made a difference. So um, I hope you don't get faculty or people in your life in general telling you that what they want you to do is more important than what you need to do for yourself because they're always wrong. Uh, a lot of you are going to get jobs. You're going to have, and, and I'll tell you from personal experience, that th this is the number one reason that people leave jobs is because they don't like their boss. I've been in that situation. I've had a boss who um, wouldn't make decisions. I didn't really care what, what they wanted me to do. It was just they didn't want to make decisions. And some of that was their own inexperience. You're going to have good bosses. You're going to have bad bosses. My suggestion to you is look at the good bosses and figure out what they did that made them good bosses and try to emulate that. And look at the bad bosses and try to say, this is not the model I want. So the problem with saying I don't want to do something is that negative models generally don't work. You have to look at positive models. You have to look and say, what should I do instead? And that would be my challenge to you. So that's not very, really a funny story, more of a serious story, but that would be my advice. Yeah, Project 5 is a total bear, and you're going to be wrestling with that bear for a while. But in the end, it, it's not worth making yourself sick over. It's not worth losing sleep over. Um, it will all work out in the, in the wash. You will run into people who didn't go to um, an amazing school like UBC. Uh, or maybe they did and they got really crappy grades, and they'll still be smart, and they'll still be able to offer things. But don't forget that. There's more to life than just grades. There's more to life than just work. I don't know what. But if you find the answer, you've got my email address. Today's failure... I had to do some digging to get this one because, in fact, Microsoft no longer has this on their website. So that link is from um, archive.org, the Wayback Machine. The internet doesn't forget. <laughs> uh, there's lots and lots of these. It's actually very interesting to look at this page because it has all of this history of, of failures. And these kinds of failures happen all of the time. This one was really good, I thought, because, again, it represents the sort of failure that you might never have even thought of. An electrical storm in Texas. As far as I can tell, Texas is home for really bad weather events and a strange electrical grid. Uh, you may be unaware of this, but in fact, in, in North America, specifically the US and Canada, uh, electrical grids are divided into regions. And Texas has its own electrical grid because the state of Texas did not want to be subject to uh, U.S. federal law. And since their, their uh, grid only covers Texas, they can avoid being covered by federal law. Downside is it means that they're not up to the same necessarily standards. So they've had problems with their electrical grid. Uh, Parts of the U.S. and Canada are actually in common electrical grids. There's one that runs from Quebec all the way down into the mid-Atlantic states. I learned all about this because I had to do work on a case involving the trading of rights to transmit electricity over the grid. This is what happens when you get a PhD in electrical engineering from Berkeley. You go into future transmission rights trading and make millions of dollars. So in this case, there was a lightning storm. It caused sags and swells to voltage feeds, feeds in Azure's south central US region, which is in Texas. By design, this shut the air conditioning down because they didn't want to burn the air conditioning out. At 8.42 UTC, oh, that would be very early in the morning in Texas, probably around, what is that, 3 AM? Uh, um, Lightning partially lost swell and a large sag in one of the data centers fell below the required voltage spec for the chiller plant. This sag triggered the chillers to power down and lock out. So we save 
the chillers. There's a backup cooling system because redundancy is where it's at. But it was set in manual mode because they had just done a new equipment installation for the backup chiller and they hadn't finished testing it yet. Do you see a theme going on here? You know, we need to change that optical device on our network card 43 seconds from the time that we power down to the time we power back up and all the swap is made and that causes us 24 hours worth of outage. Things go wrong, and things go wrong at inopportune times. So, lots of bad stuff was happening all at the same time. So the fact that there was this one system that was complaining because it had been shut down and the backup needed to be manually transferred got missed. And so the temperatures in the data center started to rise very quickly. So quickly even though they already had automated systems to shut down pieces of the data center to reduce the, the heat load, it wasn't fast enough. And so it exceeded, significantly exceeded, the, the, the cooling, the, the operating temperatures of the devices. And I don't know if you're familiar with semiconductor devices, but they have fairly high levels of heat they can handle, but once they exceed that, things start to melt. Literally, they melt and fuse. And that kind of damage is not easily recovered from. I mean, I have this crazy computer at home where I monitor the temperature on the CPU and the GPU all the time. I'm very happy. I look at the GPU in the morning and it's 29 degrees running. And then I, I'm gaming and it runs, it gets up to 33 on a NVIDIA 4090. Pretty good. That's got one heck of a cooling system. Of course, the GPU gets cooled before the CPU, so the CPU runs in the 40s, but it's in the low 40s. The operating range is up to 90 on both of those devices. So running 30, 40, perfect. Exactly where you want to be. When you start getting too high, those devices themselves internally have thermal protection where they will start shutting things down and they will start scaling things back. In the Intel processors, they have uh, they added what are uh, vectorized instructions called AVX 512. And one of the interesting problems they have with the AVX 512 operations is they run so hot that they actually slow the clock cycle of the CPU down to not melt it. It's crazy. You can see partial failures because of these kinds of heat problems. But the reason we do that is because once we exceed that, pff, sorry, your equipment is fried. You literally have to replace it. Question. Yeah. Yes. See, that's why you need to have better cooling systems. Yeah, right, and that is a problem with GPUs is that, so I water-cooled my 4090. So I literally, you, you get this, this massive card. It's like, it's like this, and it, it, it's heavy. And then you take the cooling unit off of it, and what you have is this little tiny PCB with a little GPU and a bunch of power amplifiers around it. I mean, it's literally like 10% of the size of the card. That's it? And all of the rest of it, this massive fan, this huge heat sink, Massive fans, three massive fans, huge heat sink. All of this stuff is to there to pull the heat away from that, that processor. I mean, it's insane. When you actually look at them, it's, it's insane. And you can see, if you ever take one apart, you can actually see why, oh yeah, I could see how running that would cause it to fail. Because if the heat rises too fast, you don't get a chance to thermally clamp. And... You're kind of uh, broken. And, and you wouldn't be very happy if your 3080 melted down. Although, you know, 3080s are so yesterday. So things got bad fast. Things melted down. This now meant they had to actually 
make some hard decisions. And they decided that they would do reduced service rather than lose data. See, this is the interesting thing about all of these failure cases. At some point, the automation doesn't do the job, and someone has to step in and make hard decisions about what are we going to do to fix this. Are we going to go to the backups that we find out are no longer in S3 like they should have been? Oops, I hate when that happens. And you see these levels of redundancy. And when you're finally down to that last safety net and that's all that's left, you hope that it holds you. Because when that last safety net goes, you now have actually lost people's data. You've actually violated service level agreements. This is why people pay big bucks to do software development in this space and hardware development and facilities management and all of these things. Because these become critical services. I mean, you know, Diablo 4, you can't play if their data center is melting down. And that's catastrophic for somebody. It's just really interesting. They actually had to replace hardware in this one because it melted. And so the takeaways here, unexpected things happen at the worst times. Failures compound. Recovery is slow and painful. Why do you think that Project 5 is really hard? Because we went from, you know, trying to optimize away messages in Project 4 and doing batching and all of these things, and then Project 5, now we're moving data around. We're not just eliminating messages at that point, we're moving data. And I have made this point a number of times. The most expensive thing we do is move data. Back for service failure led to a whole variety of additional failures, which you still can find blogged about. Interestingly enough, I found that the VS Code blog, Visual Studio Marketplace, had comments on this particular outage and how it basically took out a bunch of their services because they didn't have replication. They had one copy in this data center in Texas. The downside to replication, and you will see this when you work on any project where we are using these kinds of services, the downside of that sort of replication is it becomes expensive. And as you've already seen, it's really hard to reason about. What are we doing in Project 5? Well, gee, we're building Paxos on top of Paxos. I told you, it's like a layered cake. More frosting. It just gets more and more complex. And at each level, you're trusting the level below you to do its job. So keeping with the data center theme, I'm going to talk about some specific aspects of uh, data center management. I'm going to talk a little bit about some interesting, very high-speed network technologies and things that start to make you think that data centers look an awful lot like very sophisticated multiprocessor computers, because that's the way they work. And then we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about this the, the technique that Google actually built to do orchestration of services, specifically around containers. And you'll see that they do exactly this kind of layering of distributed systems, ideas, and techniques. What's well, better than one Paxos? Why two Paxos? Do we call two Paxos Paxo, uh, Pax, Paxoe? I don't know. My Greek isn't good enough to make it plural. It's not Latin, so it wouldn't be Paxi. Um, it's like the, 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 uh, the question is, what's the plural of octopus? And people often use the Latin to treat it like a Latin word, but it's a Greek word. So it's actually octopoda. But a lot of people say octopi. Octopi would be the Latin plural. These are important things to not know. This is how you win drinking games for those of you who drink. What's the plural of octopus? Octopi. No, sorry. Um, I thought this was a particularly appropriate slide since the you, you might have heard of Moore's Law. You may have missed the fact that Gordon Moore died this, uh, this week, last week. He died very recently, a couple of days ago. 
1965, he published an article, I actually tracked the original article down, in which he observed that the number of transistors we could put on a semiconductor device was doubling um, every, I think it was 18 months or two years. And that the trend line there was, w w was for the foreseeable future going to continue. And by and large, a lot of what he said has been true, not exactly true, but generally true um, ever since, which is a long time. Because, you know, 1965 was a long time ago. We have achieved this through a variety of techniques, not just uh, packing more transistors onto a piece of semiconductor material, which we continue to do. Uh, we have, I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of TSMC. Uh, TSMC is a company that specializes in the manufacture of very, 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 very dense processors. For all intents and purposes, they are the world's leader at doing ultra-high density processor uh, fabrication. Everyone else is, and there's not everyone else, there's like two other companies now that do anything in this space. It's become very rarefied. The stuff they do is absolutely insane when you get down to it. Um, there was a, 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 a have, has anyone heard of TSMC? Yeah, a couple of people, right. Yeah, um, so TSMC is based in southern, uh, southern Taiwan. Uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. And their presence there and their, their criticality to the semiconductor world is part of what creates a lot of tensions uh, in, in Asia, in that part of Asia. I mean, you know, the U.S. isn't just simply trying to protect Taiwan because of some sort of lofty principles, a lot of it revolves around the fact that if TSMC were taken out, it would have a serious detrimental effect on our ability to build advanced weapons and uh, advanced and sophisticated systems. And it would make it harder for us to build our data centers, which are absolutely insanely over the top crazy. Uh, any of you heard of ARM? So ARM Semiconductor, is a company that was started as a spinoff from Cambridge University. And they set out to design processors. They do not build them. Almost all of the ARM processors now are built either by um, Samsung or TSMC. So these guys are crazy. They keep building faster processors, and we've also found that we can specialize our processors. We just got into talking about GPUs. Google came along and said, you know, we can have tensor processing units, TPUs. And tensor processing units are quite useful when it comes to doing certain types of machine learning. Is anyone familiar what a tensor is? Think of it as a, a, a specialized kind of matrix. So these are parallel processors. They take matrices and they perform operations on the matrix. matrix. Another thing that we're now doing is we're disaggregating. We're taking what is traditionally been a monolithic computer and pulling its pieces out and separating them and saying, what happens when we do this? Why would we do that? Well, we're going to talk a little more about that. A lot of the motivation is to continue to improve our ability to build big data centers, to be honest. Lots of new technologies that keep coming out. This is not stopping. Uh, so we have high-speed interconnects that were introduced by Mellanox, and then those turned into uh, network fabrics, where it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between the network fabric and a bus. Currently, the fastest Ethernet you can get is 800 gigabits per second. 800! It's not going into your gaming PC anytime soon. Because, of course, when you start doing gaming, 
The limitation isn't usually the bandwidth. The limitation is the latency. And latency is much harder to overcome than bandwidth. Bandwidth, we just, you know, it's like building a freeway. Well, you know, we put four lanes, then we put 40 lanes, and we can get twice as much traffic through with 40 lanes. Kind of a joke, right? So we have all sorts of interesting things that have gone on. I mean, it, 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 we even mentioned things like persistent memory, which was sort of, it's a very interesting technology, and it was sort of popular for a period, but it, uh, Micron backed out of it and Intel backed out of it. There are still other people who are working towards building this. Um, I did a bunch of work with persistent memory, and, and the big advantage it had was you could have a lot of it. So where a DRAM module might have 64 gigabytes of, of memory, um, a persistent memory module of the same size could have 512 gigabytes. But it was a little bit slower. So there were interesting trade-offs around it. We build specialized accelerators. We build a disaggregation where we start detaching pieces. We'll put our memory, just memory, in a box. And we'll put just GPUs in a box. We'll put just CPUs in a box. And then we'll have them talk to each other through a network. Where does that go? What does that do? But of course, we build all of this infrastructure so we can actually do stuff. And a big way we do things now are with containers or virtual machines. Often we put containers inside virtual machines. Sometimes we find out that running virtual machines is faster than running containers. So there's a whole continuum here. Why do we use containers? Why do we use virtual machines? We use it so that we can build data centers so we can have lots of different people's stuff running in the same place. And we can provide some protection domain. So your code running there and your code running there don't actually have the ability to see what the other one is doing. And then you go to conferences like Aspolos and you find out that, oh, gee, look, there's all these interesting ways that you can actually infer what's going on in somebody else's code. It's, it, the whole security domain is very crazy. People break passwords by watching how long it takes the, uh, the encryption unit to return a response. So uh, Intel processors actually have embedded instructions for performing AES encryption, and they take a uniform amount of time to eliminate that kind of side channel. So there's a constant warring amongst all of these different pieces. We want more functionality. We want more scale. We want to make it cheaper. But of course, we don't want to compromise security. Gosh, doesn't this feel a lot like the problems we have in distributed systems where we have to worry about you know, performance and partitionability and availability and consistency and all of these things become, they fight with each other because they're not all achievable. Do the same thing here. Remote direct memory access is a mechanism by which one computer can talk to the memory of another computer without talking to the processor of that computer. In essence, it becomes a CPU bypass that just uses the network. So one of the benefits of RDMA is that it actually provides higher bandwidth and, very importantly, lower latency. Well, if I take the CPU out of the way and I put this network connection in the middle and I have one processor over there talking to some memory over here, it does kind of look like a big multiprocessor machine. It's just like, every time I look at this, I go, wow, this just feels like the way they used to build multiprocessors 20 years ago when I taught classes like how to debug blue screens of death for people who are building 32 processor PCs. It's hard to call a 32 processor PC that you spend millions of dollars for a PC. Um, because it was effective, it was Unisys, so it was effectively a mainframe. Oh, and people still use mainframes. Which look an awful lot like the things we're talking about. They're very expensive because they have these high-speed interconnects and they basically build very scalable architectures. So the biggest trade-off with using RDMA-based technologies is they tend to be higher priced. So they're more expensive. You're getting better performance, but you're paying for that performance. And it's not linear. 
And when you go out and buy yourself a high-end sports car, what you get for $100,000 versus what you get for $3 million, the $3 million car is not 30 times faster. It's maybe 30% faster. So you really pay a lot as you get higher and higher on that performance curve. So the original idea around RDMA came from research in the 1990s, ancient, ancient stuff. Uh, virtual interconnect architecture, VIA, was proposed in the 2000s. Mellanox introduced this technology called InfiniBand, which was a network mesh, high performance network mesh. About half of the top 500 machines, supercomputers, actually use InfiniBand for communications. Now, usually what happens, we start building these really fast services, and then somebody figures out how to move some or most of that ability into cheaper devices. So we have these things called uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet, which are network interface cards that perform RDMA directly in the card. Often they have a piece of firmware. So since it's firmware, you can reprogram it. You can actually change what it does. And that runs in the network card. So that's how we get the CPU out of the way. The network card has its own CPU, really. And it has the logic necessary to go fetch something out of somebody else's memory. There's a, an internet-wide version of RDMA called iWarp. I haven't actually worked with iWarp. I was like, wow, that's just kind of funky. In bidirectional RDMA, we can move data either way. So there's no, it's not a client server model, it's a peer-to-peer -peer model. But we can actually have more of a client server model. And this one's an interesting, interesting model because it starts allowing us to do things like direct cache injections. So I'm performing the processing over here, and over here I'm changing the data. And by the way, I can actually make sure that that CPU's caches are correctly serialized. Now, this CPU is not doing that work. It's this network card here that's doing it. The network card is the one that's actually injecting data into the CPU's cache. Those are pretty unusual architectures, and they're expensive. But for particular purposes, this may be justified. Last I checked, and I haven't, I admit I haven't delved into this too closely. Last I checked, the fastest key value store used RDMA. And it was able to do like 150 million key operations a second. And it's all done with NICs and RDMA. You can do communications like RPCs, standard remote procedure calls over RDMA. And they can be either one-sided or two-sided. Um, Two-sided makes it really easy because that means you can just simply make it, it just looks like another network interface. You don't have to really change your, your software stack to deal with that. Uh, One-sided means that you do have to do some change because the flow is only going in one direction there. So sometimes like if you had a, a high amount of data going one direction and you just need a control going back the other, you might use this architecture. Yes. Uh, not necessarily, right? What is the purpose of doing the remote procedure call? You want it to do something. If you can have the, the NIC do that for you, you're done. That was the, 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 the KV Direct, which is the paper I was thinking about where they were, I think it was 150 million key operations per second. So in essence, what they did was they moved the logic for managing the key value store into the NIC card itself. I'm not sure that that was using... They don't, I don't remember them talking about which model for the RDMA they were using there, but. Well, that's kind of my point, right? The NIC already has its own processor on it. So you can continue to use that CPU that's sitting on top for something else. And this is ultimately what ends up happening in any kind of offload scenario. I mean, for, for decades, people would propose TCP offload. And I'd always laugh at it and go, okay. It, it, it's not a huge win, 
but it is enough of a win that people now actually do it. And the idea was that you can compute the TCP checksums on the NIC card itself rather than computing them in the CPU. The problem was it made the NIC cards a lot more complicated because your TCP was now running in your NIC card. But processors got faster, memories got larger, capabilities got better, and now it actually does make sense to just put all of your TCP protocol in your NIC card. Well, enough of it to be able to do the checksum computation. Yes, it's totally about the communications cost of the CPU. Yep, so, so the interesting point here is that as networks get faster, they approach the speed of the, the bus between the CPU and memory. And, and in essence, this is a, a recognition of that fact, of the idea that, gosh, um, remote CPU, local CPU don't really care much. But to me, that looks like NUMA architecture. It's just a way of letting somebody far away talk to my memory without actually coordinating it with me. And that can be performant in some circumstances. But again, these are specialized techniques. These are not general techniques. You don't, you're not going to see this happening on your home PC anytime soon because there's nothing that would drive its need. But in data centers, where we really do want to have key value stores that can support 150 million key operations per second, it might make sense. And then we're going to put Paxos on top of it and move things in shards between computers. At least shard movement would be faster. Um, so this is much more recent work, right? This is from 2016. And you, some of you might actually be able to remember 2016. It was only seven years ago. But it was before the world changed, so. I don't know about you, but I have this really weird disconnect around COVID where the world just kind of changed. And so we can actually see that, I mean, one of the benefits is this RPC over RDMA actually scales really well. Look, it's nice and linear, and, and our, our ability to read stays flat, even though our ability to read in the old model of just doing read operations went down. I, I think persistent memory is really interesting, and I'm not sure exactly what drove Intel to abandon it. They did. Maybe I'm just bitter because, you know, I did a whole bunch of research on this stuff, found out really interesting things about machine architecture, and then they said, ah, we're not going to sell this anymore. One of the big benefits is in density and size. The fact that they take less energy and the fact that they allow you to have a lot more addressable memory in the same volume. Very interesting. But I thought Intel was... In all fairness, I was pretty critical because Intel was trying to put them on high-end machines, and I think it was the wrong place to put them. I actually thought it made sense to put them on low-end machines where, gosh, if I'm putting a sensor out in some place in a field where it might be running in and out of power, I'd really like to actually have some place where I know that once I put the data, it's not going to disappear. Different usage models. And so it may very well just be that the technology needs to find the problem that it's going to solve. And this will come back. I would point out that flash memory took more than 30 years to emerge as a primary storage solution. And now we buy NVMe devices because they are cheap and fast and high density and persistent. You can actually combine RPC with persistent memory. This was some work from 2020. By golly, this is like almost current. One of the things that we did in our projects is we talked about logs. We used logs. We kind of ignored a lot of the nuances and details of what goes into a log. But logs in Paxos are intended to be persistent stores. So 
But when I put something in my log, I want to know that I can get it back later. And the idea is this allows us to have a mechanism for recovering from failure. Machine crashes, we come back up, we can restore a consistent snapshot based upon what's in those logs. Well, the benefit of having persistent memory is I make a change, the change now persists. I don't need to have a separate log. It, it changes the way you think about the problem. But it doesn't make it any easier, as it turns out, because if I have to do, so append. Append is actually a terrible thing to put in a key value store, in all honesty. If you want to make a key value store really simple, put get delete. That's it. Why? Because append is a multi-operation operation. It's a read, modify, write cycle. And read, modify, write cycles are what kill us. Because now I have to read a piece of state, perform a mutation on the data that I just read, and write that back. And what happens if I get interrupted between that? How do I make that atomic? I mean, I know how we do that. We create a log. So great, we'll push the log into our hardware. Doesn't make it any easier. And essentially the point they're making here in this paper is... When you start using persistent memory, you still have to make sure you have that transactional correctness. You have to make sure that things are consistent. So when you're doing read, modify, write cycles, you have to make sure that it perf it's performed atomically. Disaggregation is a really hot area right now. Um, the idea is we want to have better flexibility in our server backbone. So what I mean by that is I want to be able to mix and match CPU, GPU, TPU, memory, network, storage. I want to mix and match these things. And we've seen some of this level of disaggregation for a long time. In data centers, they often put storage in its own rack by itself. Because frankly, the cost of going over the network to a disk drive is dominated by the cost of, of doing anything to a disk drive. When I was your age, disk drives measured latency in tens of milliseconds. And now, today, we measure disk drive latency in tens of milliseconds. It hasn't really gotten a lot faster. Sometimes we can get sub 10 milliseconds. But the real problem is, when you have something that's going around and around and around, and the, the head stays stationary, you have to wait for the rotational delay. It just takes a certain amount of time. That data's over here, now it's over there, now it's over there, now it's over there, now it's under the head, now I read it, now I'm doing... And you can't... Well, you can make it go a little bit faster. So the cheap drives turn at 5,400 revolutions per minute. That's flying very fast when you actually think about it. The fast ones will do 10,000 revolutions per minute. Twice the speed. I can't overcome the physics that's necessary for turning those things. The way that we build disk drives is insane at this point. They're all hermetically sealed. They put lubricant. These heads float off the surface of the disk drive about a couple atoms off the surface. It's pretty crazy how very, very close they run. And can you imagine skimming across the surface of the Earth? Well, you know, a couple, I don't know, uh, nanometers above the surface of the Earth. Don't hit it, because that's bad. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and, and yet we can't overcome those things. But, so that's why putting disk drives into, into racks as a disaggregation technique made sense. And then somebody said, well, this is cool. How about if we put DRAM in there, too? And how about if we put all our GPUs over in a different form? Because now we can concentrate our cooling over there because they generate a lot of heat. Actually, disk drives generate a lot of heat as well. But um, maybe it's different. And what is the benefit of doing this disaggregation? Well, the primary benefit is it allows us to mix and match what we need with what we've got. If I sit here and I build a computer, I have to make choices in advance. How much memory? How much CPU? How much storage space? What size NIC? And if I need to change that because my needs change, I got to rebuild the damn thing. 
And the reality is, in data centers, that's what we do anyway. I talked about that before. They literally build these things off-site, they bring them in on a forklift, they put them into place, boom, bolt them to the floor, somebody comes in and wires them up, and there's redundant hardware there, and so on and so forth, and when things go bad enough on that rack, we, we turn the rack off. Nobody physically goes in and flips a switch. It's all electronically done. It's all remote, right? And then that will be scheduled for replacement. And so then next month, the forklift comes in and it starts pulling the old racks out and it wheels the new racks in and we keep repeating this process. Well, okay, since we're doing it this way anyway, I don't actually care whether my forklift is lifting a computer, 25 computers, or a big array of storage, or a whole bunch of just CPUs. And in some ways, it makes it easier for me to deal with from a failure domain perspective, right? If everything in that rack is all CPUs and two of them die, I can keep running that rack. I can probably keep running that rack until 75% of them are dead. So monolithic server configurations aren't very flexible. And the idea behind disaggregation is it means that we can actually be more flexible here. And, and this is just an extreme example where we said, gee, let's, let's build these storage racks and then let's build some um, network racks. And now typical data center design is they put a big ass switch at the top, the top of rack switch, they call it the Tor switch, literally. These data center people have these conversations. They talk about this being the, the architecture. Top of rack switch, which has some very high inter speed interconnect that goes to other, other switches. So there's a switch a switch for all the switches to talk to, which has even higher bandwidth and higher processing speeds. And then from the top of rack switch, it all gets pushed down to the individual units themselves. So they've been evolving these architectures anyway. So this isn't a huge step for them, but this is what real modern data centers end up looking like. So we can do resource disaggregation where we pool different kinds of resources and attach them to the network. Our motivation here is that networks have been getting fast and faster, and our network cards have gotten more and more capable. And one of the things I added to this slide was the in-memory compute option. Actually, you're now finding that there are certain classes of problems where we don't really need a huge amount of compute power. What we need is a, a nice chunk of memory that's really, really fast. So we build these, these um, pieces of DRAM, basically, with a, a small CPU inside of them. And we do the processing inside of that. Uh, we have a couple of groups here at UBC that are doing research in in-memory compute, they call it. Most of the, the, the next set of slides come from a paper called uh, LEGO OS, which was presented in 2020 at OSDI. And it's all about how do we separate our processor and memory? How do we disaggregate, in essence? So this is, we're gonna do this stepwise. So we start off with our standard architecture here where we have um, a processor with CPUs, some cores, a TLB, a last level cache, a memory management unit, and then some DRAM. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna move our memory across the network. Okay, everything else there stays the same. The difference is that instead of talking across a memory bus, now we're talking across a network. Okay, not too hard. Everything else stayed the same. We still have page tables, we still have an MMU, we still have a TLB, the last level cache, some CPUs. What happens if we move the TLB and the MMU off of the CPU? Well, what we've just done, and this is actually a big shift, what we've just done is we've moved the virtualization domain. See, the reason we have TLBs and page tables in the CPU is so that we can translate virtual to physical addresses. But now what we're going to do is we're going to move that off and put our virtual memory domain off the CPU. This starts to become much more interesting. Wow. Well, now our page tables are, of course, in our memory. So our CPU up here actually gets simpler. It doesn't have to have virtual memory hardware anymore. 
So this is this becomes a point where we would start changing our CPU potentially. We could, the stuff we did before we could get away with without changing our CPUs. This starts to change the CPU architecture. Um, but of course, we can have a virtual memory system that sits on top of our physical memory processor now. And, and we can still support all those virtual memory applications that we are expecting to have work. And then... Now we'll move all of that into our disaggregated memory. So we really have now completely pulled all of our virtual memory work off. Each of our CPUs has its own little virtual address space. They get an isolation model here. Remember, one of the things that I talked about before is why do we use virtual machines? Why do you use containers? We try to do, do that in order to provide isolation domains. Well, here we, we still need to preserve our isolation domains. So this is a technique for doing that. But we're not using physical memory anymore. Now we're using virtual memory. And so our caches are now virtual caches, not physical caches. This is, this is the way that computer architecture works, is that if we were building houses this way, what we would do is we would take the house, put it on jacks, jack it up, and build a new floor below it. I don't know if you've seen them build high-rise buildings here, but they like to build high-rise buildings from the bottom to the top. We would do it the opposite way. We would lift the building up, put the next floor down, and then say, isn't this cool? So there are some interesting challenges with disaggregation. In fact, uh, networks are actually slower than local memory bus. They have between 25 and 50% of the bandwidth capacity. Although that's improving, an 800 gigabit per second Ethernet actually is about as fast as a local memory bus on most computers. Most. We can build faster. The biggest thing, though, is we cannot overcome the laws of physics. So we cannot completely eliminate latency. See, when we move things, when we disaggregate them and move them apart from each other, it takes longer because we can't go faster than this magic universal constant, the speed of light in a vacuum. And actually, the speed of electrons in a, a copper wire is below the speed of light in a vacuum. There you go, today's physics lesson. Don't worry. All we need to do is just simply realize that we just have to get them faster than the speed of light, and then we're fine. Because if you actually look at the equation, the equation just simply says it's hard to go the speed of light. It gets harder and harder to get to the speed of light, and if you were, if you were on the other side, it actually gets harder and harder to slow down. It, it, this is how we end up with time travel stories. So... We're going to use that extended cache in our CPU. We're going to add DRAM and hardware-based memory, host-based memory um, in the CPU. We're going to, so so we, we, we really are changing our CPU architecture now in order to make this disaggregation story work. And all of this stuff is driven by trying to run things in data centers. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to try and explain to you why this has to do with distributed systems, aside from the fact that, of course, everything we write is going to be running on these computers. We'll have to actually manage all of this stuff. And th th these things, th these data centers are absolutely insane. If you ever get to go and tour one, you probably won't walk into an operating one. And even even when I was in college, and um, I would walk in, we, we, we built a custom designed machine room with lots of foam, acoustic foam on the, on the sides of the wall. So you could walk in and you, you could hear the machines were loud, but it didn't echo very much. But you still put hearing protectors on as well. Um, and these, these are, they're very loud. Uh, they can run very hot. Because the machines can run much hotter than humans are comfortable. And we don't want you sweating all over everything. Disaggregation. Disaggregate. 
think so. All of them. Almost everything I've seen is about data centers. I haven't seen anybody arguing for disaggregation for any other reason. That doesn't mean that there won't be um, additional cases, but that's and that's very common where one party comes in and says this will solve our problem, and then someone else says, "Ooh, this would solve my problem too." So you know, maybe this will build your really cool gaming rig. I don't know. I I I, I mean. I don't know how anybody could afford to have a place to live in that would be this size, but that would be one hell of a game and gaming rig. One of the big challenges in running data centers is managing them. We have multi-tenancy. We literally have different people, different companies, different organizations using common pools of services to run their own tasks. Most of these people don't actually care what other people are doing. They're just doing this because it's a less expensive option than maintaining their own data center. But there are always some bad actors out there. We know what you've been doing. There are always some bad actors out there who will try to benefit from reading information and inferring information about what other people are doing. And this has been true in, in multi-tenancy computing for a very, very long time. So that becomes one of the issues for us. Uh, so we divide up individual tasks into smaller units. Uh, we, you can call them a process or a task. Uh, we have different sensitivities. Some things are latency sensitive. Some things are bandwidth sensitive. Of course, some things are both. And those we get to charge a lot of money for. Some things are compute intensive. Sometimes we have to have accelerators. We need GPUs, we need TPUs. Some things are data intensive. We have very large data sets. And I can tell you from personal experience, once your data set exceeds the abilities of your, your processor to cache it, it is really slow, like orders of magnitude slower. And I've seen that myself. You have the business model here requires things uh, like service level agreements, which basically say, this is the level of service we guarantee we will provide. And if we don't provide that, then we're going to have to give you some sort of recompense for that. In the Azure meltdown, they actually commented on the fact they had to refund people money as a result of that. There's been this sort of sequence of papers that identify key ideas around managing these resources. Uh, one was at Omega, which was presented at Eurosys 2013. Another one was uh, Borg, which was presented at Eurosys 2015. I don't know why Eurosys seems to attract these management papers, but that's probably because I think both of those are actually North American groups presenting at Eurosys. I think it's just because they wanted to have an excuse to go to Europe for a vacation. Sorry, a conference. Um, I would never do that. I'm not going to Rome strictly because I want to visit Rome. I'm going to Eurosys 2023. And ultimately, that led to Kubernetes, which is also Google, although they didn't, that's not a paper. That's actually just them building on top of Borg. So we're going to talk about Borg. In Borg, they have what they call a cell. A cell is a collection of machines, and it is their fundamental unit of management. Then machines are clustered together um, using a high-performance network fabric. So they have some sort of high-speed network interconnect. A cluster, then, is a set of machines in a single data center building. Single data center building. And then a data center, a site, is a collection of data center buildings. So we literally are talking like a campus with multiple big buildings filled with computers, each of which are talking to one another. Their failure domains are separated at multiple levels here. Each of these represents one of the potential failure domains. Question in the back. No, this is literally buildings. At this point, they really are talking about physical facilities. All of these data center things, you know, you do Google Cloud Platform or Azure or 
um, Amazon Web Services, they all are built like this. And, and I mean, Supermicro has a facility down in the Silicon Valley that they do pretty much the same thing. People outsource their data centers. Now, in that case, Supermicro tends to specialize. They tend to do, like, a building might belong to one customer. For, for Borg, this is literal. This is how Google designed their data centers. And you don't get a huge amount of exposure to the details of this because each of them considers it to be proprietary. So we have an application job, which in turn is a composition of thousands of tasks, so little, uh, little different things that need to be done in order to implement that application. And we have a basic queue where we put it in a queue, it's pending, we run it, and when it's finished, it's, it, we're done. And you can see there's lots of state transi transitions here, but it's basically put it in a queue, pull it off the queue, execute it, throw it away. Done. We've got our results. The only thing that we care about with these tasks is the output of the task. And the output of the task is then preserved someplace. It becomes a pipeline. We talked about pipelines last time. In the Borg architecture, and there's a lot of these Borg slides, and they're going to just we're going to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, in the Borg architecture, they have Borglets. Now, I feel like they didn't really do good justice to Star Trek here. They probably should have called this, you know, Unimatrix, Unimatrices, or something uh, to to really use those Borg concepts. But they call them Borglets. Okay, fine. So we have Borglets. We have a Borg master. So each of our racks has a Borglet in it. And that Borglet is talking to the Borg master. I don't know who makes up these. And you'll see they actually have um, a link shard. So they shard their link. So it looks like these are one logical service, but in fact, it's sharded across multiple underlying servers. We've seen this concept of sharding because that's what Project 5 is about. This whole idea that we can disaggregate a service without letting people know what we're doing. So we provide a unified API, and then underneath, we implement that API by splitting up our domain. So we have different pieces of it being implemented in different places. The Borg master is actually the logic center, the brain. There's a one Borg master in an individual cell. Uh, it handles all the requests, and it maintains the status of the jobs. It, the, the cell state is, is ephemeral, so it's only stored in memory. And so if the, if the Borg master reboots, the, all that state is gone, and we have to reconstruct it. Uh, it does maintain a pending queue. The pending queue is actually persistent, as I recall. So if we reboot, then we can recover and know what was, we were supposed to be doing. Because that's our service guarantee, right? We have a client who asks us to do something or do lots of some things, and we want to provide continuity for that. So if there's a transient failure, we come back, we want to be able to continue where we left off. The Borg master assigns tasks to individual machines. It then monitors all of the machine state inside of the cell. So we have a scheduler. Now, the interesting thing about Borg was they chose to put the scheduler Separated. So how things get scheduled to run is actually flexible. You can change the scheduler, and they do. You can change the scheduler depending upon the needs and the guarantees and, frankly, how much somebody's paying. So we can have priority. One of the benefits of Borg was they had this ability to mix production and non-production jobs. They, in essence, are building a great big multiprocessor machine with tens of thousands of nodes, and preemptive scheduling. Because at non-production workloads, hey, we're just sucking up some cycles because nobody's using them right now, are lower priority. And if somebody comes along who's paying, get out of there. We're letting the paying job go. So this provided them with a lot of flexibility. And as you get a lot of, source, of, of, of resources, this kind of flexibility actually turns to pay, it pays off pretty well. A 
A borglet is the individual agent on each individual machine that starts and stops tasks, restarts them if they fail, controls the local resources, and of course it coordinates with the Borg master. It says, hi, I'm here, this is what's going on. And so the Borg master can then check with the Borglet periodically to say, are you still alive? So we've got a heartbeat. Gosh, we've been here before, haven't we? This is just distributed systems on steroids. You're sitting there struggling to get, you know, five servers to talk to each other correctly. And here, well, let's take 50,000 of them. How hard could it be? Um, periodically, you know, the Borgmaster will talk to the Borglet, and of course, if the Borglet doesn't talk back, then it will um, mark it as dead. Might not be dead. Who knows? But it'll be marked as dead. Of course. Actually, the Borgmaster uses a Paxos implementation. <laughs> so the Borgmaster has five replicas. Hey, we're back to five servers. Isn't this great? Um, it uses a ch chubby lock that's acquired by the leader. And this is how you find out the leader. So this is the way they get their configuration data is you go and you try to grab the chubby lock and the response says, sorry, it's already locked and it belongs to so-and-so. Like, okay, that's sort of an interesting way of implementing a view server. But that's what they do. Um, one of the interesting things is when you start looking at these Paxos implementations, you realize that how you elect the leader differs across them. View stamp replication, they just picked it by network address. Lamport came along and said, well, maybe we don't have network addresses, so we'll just simply give everybody their own unique ballot numbers, and there'll be you know, some sort of increasing numbers, and we've, we've sharded the, the, the ballot space, and good. So how we choose the leader is actually more flexible, and this is just Google saying, hey, we could choose the leader using the chubby lock service. Question. Um, chubby is a, is a distributed lock manager that we talked about, I don't know, two months ago or a month and a half ago or something. It's, um, it's the thing they use the, geo, geo, uh, the, the uh, atomic clocks for. This is great. So um, only the leader in the Borgmaster collective chooses the self state. So I guess that would be the, the Borg queen. The cell leader is also the Paxis leader, leader for the replicated data store. So this is kind of interesting how we, we start combining these different replicated services together and we link them. And this is, again, another common thing we see with Paxos. When we went to multi-Paxos, we used one Paxos implementation to pick a leader, and then we used the second Paxos implementation to pick a value, and we linked the first to the second by including the, the ballot number. Now we're just doing the same kind of thing. We just glue these pieces together with sequence numbers. Awesome. Uh, lots of details here. Fail over time is approximately 10 seconds. Borgmaster does rescheduling of preemptive tasks, reduces correlated failures by uh, spreading things out. It also keeps track. It actually has this learning facility where it actually checks to see what combinations have not worked well in the past because maybe there's something that causes that 3080 to melt down. So we'll use that 3080 because it's got better cooling. And so it does learn. It has really good scalability. It can decouple the tasks from the scheduling. We get... Uh, you know, asynchronous updates in the pending queue. We can use different schedulers. A lot of flexibility here. We have to have efficient communications. We've just disaggregated absolutely everything, and we are totally dependent on the network functioning reasonably well. So, of course, we have to have really good communications here. Um, optimi optimize things. Again, like I said, you figure out which machines and which tasks go, go best together. Um, I mentioned that you can mix production and non-production workloads. Some scheduler optimizations. I'm not going to go into great detail here. If you really want to know, there's a whole paper about Borg. But I'm going to push through. We do get performance isolation here as well, which is kind of cool. They have application classes that keep track of what kind of workloads things are, and it will 
schedule things based upon those requirements. Oh, that's got lots of CPU over there, so I'm going to make sure that the CPU intensive things are there. That one needs a lot of memory, so I'm going to put it over there where I've got a lot of memory. This is one of the reasons why these the, the uh, disaggregation becomes interesting because in a disaggregated environment, you don't actually have to move the, the task, you can move the resources around as well. So that brings us to the end of this. What did we talk about? We talked about all sorts of interesting things, uh, data centers, high-speed RDMA, uh, heterogeneity, really important actually in building robust distributed systems. Homogeneous environments are actually fragile. Resource disaggregation and resource management and orchestration. And all of this ends up involving the things we've been talking about in this class. You know, even in the case where we were building disaggregated hardware, the reason we ended up building things on top of that was because we needed to have replication. And the moment we introduced replication over a network, guess what? We got one tool in the tool chest, and it's called Paxos. We can call it anything else you want. We can call it PMMC. We can call it ViewStamp for Application. We can call it Raft. But it's all the same protocol. That's kind of the scary thing. We've spent an entire term talking about effectively one algorithm. And it's hard to wrap your head around that algorithm because the order of operations is not well defined. Questions? He's putting his jacket on. He's ready to go. No, I'm done. Awesome. Well, then I will see you next Tuesday. Enjoy your Thursday off. You can sleep in on Thursday. <laughs>